Hi everyone, welcome to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, best-selling author and senior director of valuation services at CFGI, where I help my clients figure out what their most important assets are worth. If you'd like to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. In my world, business value and business performance is measured by the numbers, but savvy leaders understand that there's usually more to the story. So welcome to the program where we dig deeper to understand what really matters most in business. So depending on where you get your statistics, between 75 and 90 percent of M&A transactions fail to deliver the synergies that are initially designed in the deal construct. Why does that happen and what can be done to improve it? Today my guest is going to answer exactly that question on how to make M&A more successful. And I'm pleased to welcome Jennifer Fondreve, who's the founder and chief humanity officer of the M&A consulting firm Day One Ready, also an author of Now What? A Survivor's Guide for Navigating Through Acquisition. Did I get that right? Um, surviving through acquisition. Surviving through acquisition. Well, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Dave. So you're somewhat of an M&A survivor yourself, aren't you? I am. Three-time survivor. I should have a t-shirt. Well, tell our audience a little bit about that background. Um, well, it's, you know, it's interesting. I actually, when I was thinking about it, prior to the three survival times that I had as a marketing executive at three multi-billion dollar uh, companies, I actually worked in advertising where I witnessed a lot of mergers and acquisition. I hadn't really been thinking about it, but Kraft and Heinz, Nestle, Coors, uh, very well-known brands that have all gone through their own set of M&A. But uh, my own experience were three different um, acquisition experiences, uh, having been both acquirer and acquiree, uh, and even in one instance, I was the change agent brought in. So I've seen it from all sides. Okay. Well, so in your opinion, from what you've seen from all sides, why do most deals fail to produce the synergies? Well, I, there's a lot of there's a lot written about M and A and the failure rate. Uh, I, I think fairly consistently. Um, several factors are typically highlighted. One, that the valuation is off, that uh, the numbers in terms of where they thought the value would come from and when it would achieve it. But what I focus on are the other issues that tend to be uh, noted. It's culture fit, where, where cultures aren't aligning, aligning. And, and complexity of the integration. I think uh, frequently, uh, executives are surprised at how complex that integration is and when culture doesn't fit how how much of a misalignment that is and the impact that that can have on productivity uh, and that's typically what's been cited and certainly what came through in the interviews that I did um, when writing the book. Yeah so being a valuation specialist and having been through my share of M&A as well uh, on the transaction side deal brokering and as well as being inside organizations I, I echo those sentiments uh, so let's, you talk about the interviews that you've done for the book. Let's talk a little bit about that. What was the process and what inspired you to write the book? Uh, I think it was honestly um, delusional on my part. <laughs> I, uh, this is going to sound a little crazy, and, and I think, Dave, since you're an author, you may have had the same experience. It was an idea that I had after my first acquisition experience. I thought um, if, if people had more transparency about what to expect in a merger and acquisition, I thought, gosh, they'd have a better chance of success. In that first scenario, my company was acquired, uh, my company was Naptec, digital map maker, we were acquired by Nokia, and, and I thought that the, the potential was enormous, but that we didn't uh, achieve the potential for a variety of reasons that I, I, I won't dwell on now, but it was really in that moment that I thought, People just need more transparency. There's an opportunity here to bring that. In the second scenario, I actually was part of the uh, change agent team brought in and uh, to help manage an acquired company. And in that scenario, I realized I was a better leader to those people because I knew how they felt. I'd been in their shoes, and I was a better leader versus other leaders who had never been through a merger and acquisition. And so, again... Uh, the idea was, man, I should just write this in a book. And then in my third role, we were acquired by a private equity firm. But by then, I knew the playbook. So people were like, wow, you seem so calm and, and uh, you know, you're not worked up about this. I said, I, because I know the playbook. I've seen how this plays out. I, I know where we're going. 
And it was really, I would say, in that third one, uh, two things happened. I kept saying, there's got to be a better way through M&A. And then I finally realized I needed to show what a better way through M&A looked like. And so that's really um, the moment that I thought, I I've got to write this in a book. Bring transparency to the journey so that people have a, a greater chance for success. Uh, and that's really what started it yeah, I couldn't all. agree with you more about transparency. Everybody wants to know what's going on. Even if things are a little bit vague, just being communicative and sharing that vagary certainly is uh, endearing building trust for sure. Uh, yeah, and you know what's, what's interesting, Dave, and, and maybe you witnessed this as well, I understand why there can't always be transparency in the moment, right? Either legally, or through regulations and compliance, executives can't say something. Um, or, honestly, they don't know the answers. But in the interviews that I did, there's enough consistency that my book is intended to just make you smarter about, here, here's what's, here's read between the lines, here's what's not being said. And, and the more that I could make people smarter about, this is how things are really playing out, if this is what you're witnessing, here's what's really happening, and it's built on interviews that I've did, done with over 60 executives, it at least gives people a chance to go, okay, now I know what's going on and why it's going on. So I get why there's not transparency in the moment, but I think that, that, that there's an opportunity to bring greater clarity to what's really happening. Talk a little bit about who are going to benefit from reading the book. And my understanding from just reading what I'll call the executive summary that you shared with me, uh, it's for everybody in the deal ecosystem. Is that right? It is. It is. I would say my, uh, my muse, uh, if I can call it that, it's really, I like to call it the people who aren't in the room when the deal is made, but who are burdened with the execution, right? I wrote the I wrote a book that I wish I'd had when I'd gone through my three different scenarios. And when I witnessed what happened to other people, it's the book for them, right? Those people who may not have um, had the privilege of insight into why the deal was done, what the expectations were, but suddenly are expected to make the deal successful. And so those are the people who the book was initially intended for. Uh, but the benefit of it is in interviewing so many executives, and I, and I interviewed people who were both M&A survivors and practitioners, and whether it was CEOs, CFOs, HR, middle managers, private equity, investment bankers, I, I really wanted it to be a comprehensive um, set of lessons learned and insights and best practices. And so they equally said, this book really can serve the needs of of different target audiences, giving executives insight on why their workforce is reacting the way they are reacting, how you can be a smarter and better leader as you communicate the deal, um, helping people anticipate the stages of grief uh, that a workforce will go through, and then even the changes in personality. There's a big section of the book where I talk about the, the fact that you will have a whole set of new bosses, but equally what can be unnerving is that people who you considered friends and allies will change when operating from a position of fear. So all of that, um, the way I paint the picture, it really, uh, it can help anyone who's been involved in M&A or anticipates and sees it on the horizon. Yeah, you just touched on a lot of things there that really resonate in the M&A space. When you talk about coming from a position of fear and what that does and changing relationships, dynamics, strategic imperatives, and I know you've taken a little bit of a satirical spin uh, in illustrating the book, and I think we've got some caricatures that we can put up on the screen. Uh, and just recognize that some people are going to be listening, some are going to be watching. So, watching. So, if you can describe uh, what we're seeing here, we've got one up now. I don't know if you're able to see that one. No, I can't see it. Just uh, let me. <laughs> Maybe you can describe it to me. Yeah, that Dave. looks. That looks like the, <laughs> uh, the the missing in action uh, employee, the one hiding yeah. under the desk. Wait, let me first do, uh, I wanted to illustrate, the. I, I illustrated 10 different personalities. What came out in the interviews were certain personalities consistently emerge in a, in a merger or an acquisition. And two thoughts for me was, um, I felt that so many books on M&A were very academic. It, it felt like people hadn't really gone through it and didn't understand the emotional nature of M&A. And so for me, illustrating the characters 
helps bring to life the personalities, what you witness and what you experience. But I also wanted it to be to diffuse the tension, right? To have a little fun with it because, you know, whether it's a know-it-all or the ostrich, the person who sticks their head in the sand and, and doesn't, you know, hopes that everything will go away. Bringing those personalities to life really helped reinforce that people change, right? And it's not to judge them right or wrong. But the nature of cartoons is to just kind of help you laugh a little bit and go, oh, my God, I, I've experienced a know-it-all. Or to the, the illustration you just highlighted, the missing in action. So uh, I jokingly say those people can be in your company even before a merger or an acquisition. Uh, and M&A just aggravates it uh, more because they're the people who nobody really is quite sure what they do. They rarely sign up for a leadership role. They... They are uh, on conference calls, but you don't even always know that they're there until suddenly you hear their name at the end. Oh, hey, you know, this is Bob. Thanks. But no one is clear what they do. And in a merger and acquisition, particularly when it's a large company, uh, they can they can almost recede into the background. That's why that illustration, if you will, really <laughs> highlights the fact that you've got people who hide. They they you know they're they're hoping not to be appointed anything. Um, but that can be enormously detrimental. Um, with each of these characters, I, I highlight that um, the MIA character in particular, if people see that in an um, M&A scenario that some people aren't doing anything, it can be enormously frustrating and demoralizing because uh, unfortunately what tends to happen is as things are being figured out, people take on multiple roles as they're trying to really figure out what's their role in this new world and so if they see people doing nothing, it can really uh, hurt productivity as people go, well, why should I be working so hard? So that's, that character in particular can be disrupt disruptive that way. Before we, before we jump into the rest of the characters, uh, I'm being told that we have to take a quick break, Jennifer. So don't go okay. anywhere. And you don't go anywhere. We'll be right back on Behind the Numbers after this quick opportunity to boost your brand. Adding your company logo and website on screen during your interview will allow viewers to recognize your brand instantly. Incorporating images and video clips is another great way to showcase your product during your live segment. Let viewers see how good you really are. And most importantly, there's you and your interview. For less than the cost of a newspaper, direct mail, or a magazine ad, you can leave our studio and within 48 hours have a permanent digital copy of your live segment to link to your social media, embed into your company website, or use in email marketing. Investing in your brand is so very important, and we can't wait to have you as a guest. Shelter dogs aren't broken. They've simply experienced more life. If they were human, we would call them wise. They would be the ones with tales to tell and stories to write. The ones dealt a bad hand who responded with courage. Do not pity a shelter dog. Adopt one. Say we've got grit and we'll take it as a compliment because it's our uncommon drive our spark within that brings us together and sets us apart. We are temple made. And when others take shortcuts, when others take breaks, when others take the easy way, we take charge. Add us on social media to watch bloopers, behind the scenes footage, previews, and more. Welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder. Today we're talking about how to make M&A more successful with my guest Jennifer Fondreve. Uh, Jennifer is the founder and chief humanity officer of the M&A consulting firm Day One Ready. Um, before the break we were talking about some of the character, caricature, easy for me to say, illustrations that are in your book. Um, I want to go back up on the screen if our production folks can do that. And um, There was a, a former rock star image. Yeah. You could speak to that if you would please. And this one, I would have to say, in the interviews I did, uh, tended to be the favorite of, uh, of people when I talked to them about it. And I think it's, 
it's because a lot of people have seen that personality type during an M&A transaction as the post-deal integration starts to take place. And essentially, it's that, that person who was your company's rock star, right? They had the Midas touch. It could be the person who was the head of sales. Um, maybe they were head of product, but everyone in the company loved them. They had the CEO's ear. They really could do no wrong. And unfortunately, what can tend to happen post M&A deal, during that integration, the metrics for success can change. Typically, they do. And your rock star got to that point because of certain metrics. And if they don't adapt and pivot and understand that the metrics have changed, uh, they can get stuck in their old ways. What, what, you know, what I often say, and this is from Marshall Goldsmith, right? What got you here won't necessarily get you there, but they're convinced that, listen, I, I was a success based on my old formula. Why should that change? And unfortunately, uh, it's, it's why I, I jokingly said they're still playing rock and roll and everyone's moved on to disco. And the, the, you know, the, the issue for them is if they don't pivot and if they don't adapt, um, people aren't going to wait to bring them along. And, and so it can, be, it can be a shame because they can be amazing contributors, but you, they've got to adapt. Yeah, no question. Uh, another image I know that you shared was the Black Widow. Yes. Uh, this one is a tough one, uh, and a number of people confessed that they had dealt with a black widow. And essentially, if you know anything about the black widow spider, um, she is infamous. She's the most venomous uh, spider in North America, but also infamous for eating her mate. And the uh, analogy in an M&A scenario is that the black widow can, is someone who poses as an ally, Maybe you're commiserating about the insanity of the M&A deal and you share openly information, either your frustrations or some ideas or uh, things that you want to do. And the Black Widow, unbeknownst to you, is really taking all of your information and, and quietly throwing you under a bus. And so, and again, you know, I'm about rabid transparency, so I, I talk to these different character types intentionally to say, these are the types of actions that they take that you need to be aware of. So I don't try and create paranoia, but I will, I will highlight. You've got to be careful about who you share your information with. You want to make sure you've built trust and you understand where that person's coming from in order to make sure that you really are going to be able to collaborate in the future. So the warning around the Black Widow is just you know, be sensitive to the fact that people will change when operating from a position of fear. People may pose as an ally, and you've got to be smart about really, um, are their intentions true or not? Yeah, well said. So Jennifer, for our audience who would like to learn more about you and how to contact you, what's the best way that they can reach you? First and foremost, uh, my website, jenniferjfondreve.com. And I can spell that if, uh, if you need to or if, uh, if you're going to post that because it's a complicated last name. It took me, took me it years out. to figure out how to spell it as a kid. Sure, spell it out. So Jennifer, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R, J, Fondreve, F as in Frank, O-N-D-R-E-V-A-Y.com. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. We have about five minutes to go in the program here. Time does fly on Behind the Numbers. wanted to talk to you about the name of your firm, Day One Ready. Yeah, it, it came from my own experience. It, and, and frankly, from the interviews I did as well. In, in my experience, the expectation was day one tended to be the day where the announcement was made and here's where we go from let, let's make this work from here. That's when they started thinking about the people strategies, what was really, how the, exec, how the vision was going to be executed. And in my experience, as well as those I interviewed, day one is really the day that an executive, a business owner, um, whoever the leader is, first considers a merger or an acquisition. Because the moment he or she has that idea to merge or acquire or be acquired, they start making decisions differently. They have a different filter, a different lens. They evaluate things differently. So even if they haven't said to anyone, I'm considering a merger or I'm considering an acquisition, how they make decisions 
is impacted. And so my belief is it's that moment you first have that idea to do a merger and acquisition, that's day one. And so being day one ready means before the deal is even announced, it's that due diligence letter of intent time frame when you're just considering what might this look like what will the organization need to be in order to support this vision? It's at that moment, that's really the sweet spot of day one. And it's being ready so that when you make the announcement, you have clarity on what the organization looks like, the roles that will be required, and the people that will fill them. Because if you delay that decision and delay that discussion and you don't have that alignment, that denou- the announcing it, and then expecting to figure it out then, you're really undermining the potential um, for deal success. Yeah, and my experience has been that employees tend to notice when uh, decisions are made around selling behaviors change, uh, there's absences in the office that maybe there weren't before. So when, when you're at that spot, if you're a leader uh, inside an organization, what's the most important skill set that you can bring to the table so that you can navigate this process and, and not create that fearful situation for your teams? Well, one of the things, and I I highlighted in the article that I wrote for Harvard Business Review, it it sounds trite and cliche, but you've got to walk the talk. Oftentimes what can happen as a leader is, if you're saying one thing, but your actions don't reflect it, your decision-making doesn't reflect it, how you lead the team or direct them, if you're saying, yes, you know, this is the vision, this is what we're doing, but From an action standpoint, you either appear not to be behind it or you make exceptions or you say, well, yes, that's important, but we're not going to do this. Then your your team is not only confused, but then doesn't really believe you're either behind it or they're waiting for something else to happen. So leaders have a critical role in walking the talk and really demonstrating here's here's what this vision is about and here's what your role is in helping us execute this vision. I think too often times leaders assume, because they've been living with it for a while, frequently, that everyone understands why we chose this path, what the vision means for everyone, and what their role is. When more often than not, a workforce doesn't. They, they're they still digesting the the news as well as what their potential role is, it, is in it. And so people have jokingly told me, well, you're kind of like emotional intelligence for MNA. I, I reinforce that that toolkit, that part of your toolkit, you really have to d- dig into more during an M&A scenario. You've got to help your team connect the dots and help them to realize the role that they play in making that vision possible. I think we've got about 60 seconds here estimating, but I want to ask you one other quick question if you can answer it quickly. And that's the, with regard to the uh, reliance on data. We're a data-driven economy. Everybody relies on numbers. Um, programs called Behind the Numbers for a Reason. Can you speak just briefly, very briefly, uh, about the over-reliance on data? And then we've got to wrap. Right. Well, an M&A is probably the most data-driven decision there is. So my comment always is data is important, but use it as an information, a data point, and, and use your intelligence and experience and collective experience over the years of work that you've done to make sure the data informs it but doesn't dictate your actions. Well said. On that note, we're going to have to wrap. So, uh, Jennifer, I thank you so much for joining us on Behind the Numbers today. Hope to have you back again sometime after your book comes out, perhaps. Thank you, Dave. Really enjoyed being with you. Great. Thanks so much. And for you watching and listening, we'll see you next time on Behind the Numbers. Great experience that you'll be sharing with everyone you know while increasing